I had this vast array of soldiers as far as the eye could see. And many of these young soldiers were 17, 18, 19. But for an accident of a year or so, it could have been my son I was looking out there who could have been going into war and could have been killed in a few days' time. Uh, and I thought they deserved to know that they had the whole country behind them without a shadow of doubt. And that was what was in my mind. Sir John, tell us what it felt like. You, you won that election, you walked in. What was the difference that you noticed immediately between being prime minister and being a very senior cabinet minister? Well, it was different. I remember we had a vote in the House the evening uh, I became prime minister. And I went in there and you could feel the conversation stop when I walked in. And I actually made a brief speech in the eye lobby that particular evening. And, and you notice there is a different attitude. Uh, power resides with the prime minister and that has an impact. And you notice that pretty soon. In you fact, you notice it immediately. You felt something. You felt something, yes. It was different. Suddenly, people reacted to you differently to the way they did the previous day. And, and, and that is as much to do with the office as with the individual. That's why I, I, I think there's a degree of formality about being prime minister. It's not a question of being stuffy. But I think the prime minister needs a degree of formality because that is what is required by the office, even if not welcomed by the individual. Coming on from that, give us a sense of what you thought the moral responsibilities of being a prime minister are. It's quite difficult to answer that um, without sounding pious or sanctimonious. Um, let me have a crack at it at the risk of doing one or the, uh, the other. In terms of the moral responsibility, and perhaps I can do it by mentioning the thing that I least like doing and... Uh, most regretted during the time I was there. On the day I became Prime Minister, we were heading for a serious recession. If you remember, interest rates were 14%. Inflation was very nearly 10%. Growth was down to half a percent, and we were going into what was going to be a very deep recession. In order to correct that, we had to do some pretty uncomfortable things in government. We had to put up some taxes. We had to cut public expenditure. We did many things that caused an awful lot of pain to people. The things that I wished to do when I came into politics were precisely the opposite of what I had no choice but to do during the period of that recession. And the belief that we didn't care was simply untrue. But I had a thing about inflation in particular because I remember in my childhood that for us to get through the week, my mother often had to borrow money. I don't ever remember her in my youth buying herself a new dress or a new pair of shoes or going off to the hairdresser or spending money on herself. And I knew there were many families up and down the country who would be in a similar position. But I had no choice if I was going to bring inflation down. And that was immensely damaging. It made us look hard-hearted. It made us look as though we didn't care. And many people would genu genuinely have felt we didn't. And the opposition, of course, Alistair, were making it clear that they felt we didn't. And that was perhaps their job, but that's what they were doing. So that was extremely difficult. The moral aspect was it, if I may say so, on the day we left office, interest rates had fallen from 14% to 6 Inflation had fallen from, it went up to over 10% to 2.6%. Um, Growth from being in recession was at 3.5%, which I think is the largest we've seen it for a very long time. And, and the public finances were 1 billion in deficit. It had risen to 46 billion. So there was a complete turnaround. I don't think you'll find figures like that very often in politics, if at all, in, the last, in, in, in living memory. And yet we had caused so much hurt and we had been there so long and we had blue-on-blue blue battles, which is always absolutely fatal for any government. For those three reasons, we went down to a terrible defeat. But it's also uh, interesting to note that we did it because we thought we had to get rid of inflation. And the fact of getting rid of inflation lasted for a very long time. 
I do think the way the government behaves can often, any government, not just the one I, I was lucky enough to lead, but any government can look callous when in fact the reasons behind it are much more complex and rather different. I want to talk about the Gulf War. Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, the Gulf War begins, you have to commit or you decide to commit UK troops. And yet it's clear from reading your book that you really felt it mattered not just to get the politicians on board, but you had, I think you had the Archbishop of Canterbury, mm. Runcie, and Cardinal Hume come yes, in. I did. And you briefed them on the whole thing. Mm. I was blown away by that. Well, I think it was necessary. If you have young men on your behalf, they were predominantly young men. I remember addressing them on a tank, and I had this vast array of soldiers, as far as the eye could see, surrounding this tank in Saudi Arabia. And I looked at them, and they were very young. And I knew, which they did not know, that the war would actually begin on the 12th of January. And the 12th of January was my son's 16th birthday. And many of these young soldiers were 17, 18, 19. But for an accident of a year or so, it could have been my son I was looking out there who could have been going into war and could have been killed in a few days' time. Uh, and I thought they deserved to know that they had the whole country behind them without a shadow of doubt. And that was what, uh, that, well, that was, what was in my mind. And let's go to um, Black Wednesday, mm -hmm. uh, 16th September 1992. I guess of all the days of crises that you had, whether it was mad cow disease or the Gulf War or all the different things, that must have been the worst day of the lot, was it not? It was. It was, and the most, most frustrating for a different reason. Because, what, let, let me go, why did we enter the exchange rate mechanism? Um, we entered the exchange rate mechanism because we had a huge inflationary problem and had had since the 1960s, and no government, Tory or Labour, had managed to tame inflation for a long time. Time and again, things had been tried. It had become too difficult, too painful. Policy had changed. Inflation had dipped a little and come back. Now, I hated inflation with a passion I cannot begin to tell you because I learned about it. If the week is longer than the family's money, that's a problem. Mm. And inflation means that applies for everybody. So I was determined in, in, in our term of office not to back away from handling inflation. We had run out of everything except the exchange rate mechanism. When we went in, it was to almost near universal acclamation. Even mm. the Telegraph and the Sun were warmly supportive. The Labour Party was strongly supportive. John Smith had been kicking me for ages about why we hadn't gone in. Bank of England were. Bank of England were, Paddy were, CBI was. Only a handful of people opposed it for different reasons. And what happened subsequently was the, the, the Deutschmark began to change the policy of the Deutschmark began to change. And what happened with uh, Black Wednesday was there was turmoil in Northern Europe with interest rates at phenomenal levels over a couple of nights. And the governor of the Bundesbank said something at a private briefing, mm. which implied that the turmoil would hit Sterling next. He didn't name Sterling, but he said something that led people to believe that. And so everything turned on Sterling. On the day, uh, we were facing huge outflows of, of money. We tried to protect to stay within the uh, uh, the ERM. We had signed up to it in Europe. And the only lever you had was interest rates, the essentially. Only, the only lever we had was interest rates and support from other governments. Uh, strange to relate, we didn't get the support from Germany that we thought we would have. And later, when the French franc hit the same problem, they did get support from the Germans. So that was a very sore point indeed. But the fact of the matter is it became clear as we put interest rates up. We had got them down under the ERM from 14 to 10 percent, I think. We put them up to 15 before realising it wasn't working. And then we had to withdraw from the ERM. Mm. If we had done it without battling, it would have been seen as bad faith apart from anything else. Now, maybe these days people don't care about bad faith. But I did then. And Al Alison, maybe it's a bit of a question to you. How important was that debacle in Labour's subsequent victory? And, and how, at the time, did Labour present what happened to Sir John Major's government? It was fundamental, wasn't it? I think, I think it was a defining moment from which the government probably never recovered. 
because it sent the sense was you were losing control of your own strategy and your own policy. It was it, it it was a political disaster. Yeah, but what I was about to say it was it was not an economic disaster, because when we were driven out of the ERM, we were looking to see how we could withdraw because it had done its job. We didn't enter the ERM as a preliminary to a single currency, which is what the Eurosceptics always feared. Mm. We were never going to do that. Lawson wasn't, and I wasn't. So we were looking to see how we could get out of the ERM. Now that was more difficult. Because if you withdraw from the ERM, the markets say, ah, you've given up fiscal discipline and you have to put up interest rates. So we were trying to, we were trying to deal with that problem. And uh, the crisis came upon us before we could deal with it. So it was not an economic disaster for us, but it was a political disaster. How did, how, what about personally? How did you feel when, that, when you were watching these screens and they're just going wild? How did you actually deal with that? Well, you, it's, it's, it's just something you have to deal with. You, you don't go and stay in a corner and, 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 and weep about it. You, you just have to try and deal with what's happening and make a judgment as to what you can do. And we made judgments. I was in the room with a number of other senior members uh, of the government, and we made judgments, and eventually we concluded that interest rates were not going to work. The die was cast. We had no choice but to withdraw from the exchange rate mechanism. Let's go to the the big fault line for a succession of conservative leaders, probably going back to Ted Heath, mm. um, certainly for Thatcher, certainly for you and all other leaders since, and that's that's Europe. Um, again, going back to, to your book, the I covered a lot of the events that you were talking about as a journalist. and I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rory, do you want to ask about that? And well, I, would, I, I, I no, do just really want to. John is much too polite. <laughs> Well, that's that's because he's not as tribal as you are. Um, he's probably not trying to get a seat on Rishi's list. Uh, what about the, the 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 Maastricht Treaty negotiations, which I covered and I thought I had a sort of handle on, but that felt like one of the most difficult, complicated European negotiations. So, just give I'd really love a sense of who the key players were, how you. What what the pressures that you were under coming back for that you were being fed back from London and how you sort of operated as you were trying to get the agreement that you finally got? There were several points that were uh, fundamental. Uh, the Europeans were going to move towards the Maastricht Treaty, whatever we said, and uh, they would if if we had just tried to block it, we would have made ourselves complete outliers in Europe, and we would have lost all the influence that we had in Europe. The point about negotiation is you give something to get something. You don't just say, I'm having this and take your throw your toys out the pram if you don't get it. There were two things that were a red rag to the majority of people in Parliament. Um, one of them spread long across, widely across the Labour Party, the other didn't. The first was not joining the euro currency. Nobody thought I could negotiate a deal that kept us out of the euro. I did. The second was the social chapter, which we conservatives believed, rightly or wrongly, was going to be a job-destroying event. Nobody thought we could negotiate our way out of that. We did. And so those were the two things which led people to declare the negotiation was a triumph on the day the negotiations were complete. And um, the biggest single mistake that I made in politics was not to get the Maastricht Treaty through before the 92 election, but we ran out of time. Mm. Uh, there were three dates, and the date I picked for the 92 election, the 9th of April, was a sentimental date because it was the day I met Norma. Oh, but um, dear, 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 but we, dear. we couldn't have gone on any longer, mm. and so there wasn't time to get the Maastricht Treaty through. And since it had had a massive majority in Parliament. There seemed no difficulty in leaving it till the next Parliament. What I did not foresee was that the nature of the Conservative Party would change with the membership of the Members of Parliament in the 1992 election. The old guard who'd been in or after the war, who believed unity with Europe was imperative for the future security of our country, left Parliament. And in came people who were imbued with a different view about Europe and were prepared to vote against it. And I should have really taken the treaty through before, but I didn't. And so new people coming into Parliament 
led by some people who'd been there and encouraged by others who should have known better, caused a great deal of trouble in getting the treaty through the House of Commons and it disrupted the whole parliament and in many ways blew the government off its programme. And do you regret not do you regret not having spent more money? I mean, of course, Labour came in, took the results of your economic boom, found a good exchequer, and were able to increase public spending. Boom. In a very successful. Boom. Are you saying way. boom? I mean, Rory, Rory's becoming a spokesman for the Conservative Party's history today. Um, yes, uh, I, I would have liked to spend more money, but of course, I wasn't in a position to do so. We, we were still dealing with the problems of inflation and making sure that it didn't get out of control and bring it down, which which we did. As I say, from went over 10% at one stage down to 2.6% and growth up. But the just when we were in a position where we could have spent, and I would have spent, we lost the election and uh, and Gordon spent it for us. The book that you kindly said Norma was halfway through, But What Can I Do?, uh, there is a chapter which begins by quoting a speech that you made not long ago, the title of which was In Democracy We Trust? Question mark. And admittedly, it was when Boris Johnson was at his peak, as it were. But the question mark said to me that you have real concerns about whether we are going to be able to sustain democratic systems. I, I do. No, I, I think I do. But I think that's because in, in, in some ways... There are bits of them that are a bit out of date, frankly. I mean, there are several things I had in mind. Firstly, I had in mind the growth of populism. I also had, because it goes hand in hand with this, the growth of intolerance. Populism isn't a political creed. It's a self-interested and selfish uh, creed. It, uh, it promotes its cronies, not the people who are best suited to a particular job. It recklessly seeks out scapegoats in order that they can attack the scapegoats to the general encouragement of the populace. It's an unpleasant way of conducting public life and it needs to be seen for what it is. If it is seen for what it is and if it is not supported uh, nationally in the media, then it will be defeated. Um, and, and I think that can certainly be done. But I had wider things in mind as well. Our politics has changed at the grassroots. It's very difficult to claim these days that the three major parties are mass movements. Mm. They aren't. Millions of people now have better things to do with their life than join the Conservative, Labour or Liberal parties. And they don't. And the constituency parties have shrunk. And with the constituency parties shrinking... It is in the nature of life that the people who feel most strongly pro-Tory, pro-Labour, pro-Liberal remain, and the people who are middle of the road, but on balance think, this is the right mob for me, drift away. And the danger that arises from that is you're going to have people who are more Tory, more Labour and more Liberal, as the people selected as candidates and elected, and you get a more frac fractious, disputatious parliament than you have had before, in which you can't lean across the aisle. And other things have helped with that. For example, one well-meaning thing was Robin Cook's reform of ours in the House of Commons. Now, it was meant to make the House of Commons more family friendly, but it's had a secondary effect. It means there are no late night sittings. Tory Labour's and Liberals are not sitting there in the smoking room or the tea room, getting to know one another and talking to one another. There were, used to be, quite a considerable number of friendships across the party barriers. It wasn't so tribal. They weren't all in their, in, their, in, in their tribal hideouts, poking nothing but opposition at the other side. And what about the institutions? What, what, what would you do about the House of Lords as a, as a revising chamber? If you have an elected House of Lords, the people elected to it are likely to be people who could not get themselves elected to the House of Commons. So the cream of those willing to face election will get in the Commons. The Lords would be secondary. And if it was all elected, you wouldn't have the experience of the captains of industry, the great academic leaders, the leaders of uh, the armed forces, who have a lifetime of experience in revising the legislation. They don't make legislation, they revise it. Mm. And an elected House of Lords would not be in a position to do that remotely as well. So I do not in any way favour an elected House of Lords. I do favour 
an uh, appointed House of Lords, maybe not the way it's done now, um, of a much smaller size than the one we have got. And in terms of things like prime minister's nominations, I don't think you can stop them and I don't think you should stop them. What I do think is you should limit the number of nominations to so many for every year the Prime Minister has served. So Liz Truss should get 0.6 OBEs <laughs> in her resignation honours. Well, I, I, I wasn't planning to determine what the award should be. But clearly, uh, Tony Blair who served, and M Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair, who served 11 and 10 years, would get more nominations than I would who served seven, or David Cameron who served six, and, and so on. Um, because I think you would remove some of the irritations to the public if you were able to do that. Yeah. I'm amazed you didn't put any 29-year-old interns into your into the House of Lords when you resigned. Plainly an oversight. Mm -hmm.